Hi, today for the Center for Healthy Sex lecture series, we're proud to welcome Giselle Jones, who will be presenting on mindful intimacy. Hey, that was a great introduction. One of the, the things I, I also am passionate about, obviously, is mindfulness. And I recently achieved my certification in mindfulness facilitation at UCLA's Mark Institute. That's M-A-R-C, the Mindful Awareness Research Center at the um, Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Behavior Studies at UCLA. And it was a year-long program. Um, I did a year-long program before that just to kind of bolster my personal practice in meditation. And I just, I love it. People come from all over the world for it who get in. And it's everything from police sergeants to therapists to teachers to, it was just a great diverse group of people, education. And I just really, really enjoyed it. But I came into mindfulness. I had been doing yoga for a long time and living in New York and dealing with the streets of New York I needed something to ground myself, um, and I found yoga, and that was really helpful, which is actually a form of mindfulness. And then when I was in grad school here, it was just an immense amount of work. I went back after having a career as an artist for a long time, and I, I when in grad school, it just became really, really difficult just to, to manage everything. It was an intense amount of work, and then as, if you know the MSW program, we do our internship during those years, so my first one, I was placed in Watts in a high school where kids go when they get kicked out of all the other schools, um, a, like a continuation school, but it was a charter school. Day one, closed for race riding and thieving. Everyone's throwing kids at me. I hadn't even started classes yet. First year, I used my experience. I'd been an actor. I'd used my experience as an actor, just be like, okay, I'm in this, like, Morgan Freeman, Michelle <laughs> Pfeiffer role. This is my role, and I just embrace it. But I really needed, there was a lot of suffering, a lot of trauma. Obviously, we deal with a lot of trauma here as well, dealing with people who have sexual issues. But dealing with it with kids and young people was particularly hard, and I needed something. And I found the Mark Institute. It was free for students there, and it was really helpful. And I helped advocate to have a uh, sit once a week in our building at the um, Luskin School of Public Affairs. So that was really helpful. I got involved with that, started um, TAing and volunteering, doing um, mindfulness and yoga through different endeavors. So it's really helped me, and I bring it into the work I do with clients here uh, across the board with sexual performance issues, anxiety, trauma, addiction, and it helps me to, to regulate and kind of see what's going on. I kind of have a feel sometimes for what's going on with the client by what's going on in my body, as I'm sure a lot of you know. And um, so I, I really enjoyed this work, so I was really excited to have the opportunity to talk. So I'm going to try not to talk too much off and get to a lot of the experiential things I want to do with you today. So I, there may be a couple things that I um, skip over, but these are the objectives, as mentioned, just to give you a little bit of knowledge about the neurobiological benefits of mindfulness. And um, as I said, even more importantly, the experiential exercises on um, self-regulation and deepening intimacy with both ourselves and interpersonally with others, and how we can do that with ourselves and with our clients and teach our clients to do that in their own relationships as well. So I just wanted to do a little poll about mindfulness, and you know, there's so much information and so much heat around it right now, but I wanted to see what your experience of it was or what, what you might think that it is or have a definition for, because there's a lot of definitions of it, and they're all right. So, um, what does mindfulness mean to you? And anyone can just raise their Being hand. Being aware of the present moment. Being aware of the present moment. Yeah. Key factor. Present moment and awareness of it. Yes. Noticing without judging. Noticing without judging. Yes. Non-judgment. Yes. And on purpose. Oh, and on purpose. Yes. Deliberate. Mm -hmm. Non-judgment. Present moment attention. Was that what you were going to say? Okay. Great. So, that's basically covering... I do a, a loose variation of basically the John Kabat-Zinn, but yes, paying attention mm -hmm. to the present moment deliberately, on purpose, and with non-judgment. Non-judgment, sometimes I add with compassion, mm -hmm. so with, for what's going on. <clears throat> Both are kind of in the, on the same side of the coin. But, so why? Why is all this, this hype around mindfulness? Why should we do it? This, not, this, is, this is great, but why, why should we do it? And I'll just talk a little bit about one of the studies that appeals to me that was done in 2011 at Harvard. And it was um, MBSR, stands for Mindful, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. And that's, uh, that was created by John Kabat-Zinn. And, <coughs> pardon me. And M there's an MBSR 
course, that they did a pre and post uh, measurement study of. It was maybe about 18 participants, never meditated before. They were put in a once, once a week course for eight weeks and then given an assignment to meditate at home for, um, I think the average that they, they reported they did was about 27 minutes um, average per, per participant. So they measured at the beginning using, you know, we now have the, the science and the technology to measure brain activity without being intrusive. So they measured before and after the, in the prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and also the, um, I want to say, hippocampus, I was going to say hypothalamus, hippocampus. And so the anterior cingulate cortex is associated strongly with self-regulation, as well as learning from past experiences to make you know, optimal judgment and optimal decisions. So, and also the, the I keep wanting to say hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the hippocampus is associated with emotion and memory. So when you think about emotion and memory, if you have unregulated emotion around negative memories, what kind of disorders does that bring to mind for you? Anxiety and depression, exactly. Anything else? PTSD, trauma, exactly. And they're showing that when there is a, a smaller hippocampus, when it shrinks, that is associated with an increase in depression, an increase in PTSD. So what they noticed after only eight weeks with these new meditators, and this is only eight weeks, 27 minutes a day plus this course, is that the activity, the gray matter, had actually bolstered in the ACC and the anterior cingulate cortex. That again is increasing self-regulation, and increasing an ability to make sound decisions based on previous experience, as well as a bolstered gray matter in the hippocampus, or in the hippocampus, yes. Right. <laughs> well, I was so attached to that, in the hippocampus, um, decreasing or known to be associated with a decrease in depression and in trauma response. So I thought that was pretty profound for only eight weeks. And they're finding things as well as a decrease in you know, the fight flight centers of the brain as well as the increase in the frontal cortex, which is all about decision making and being present. So I thought that was really a great one. But just to simplify, mindfulness, bringing us to the present moment, takes us away from ruminating on the past, which, which can lend us into depression or depressive symptoms, or being you know, uh, obsessed or worried about the future, which can lead to an increase in ang anxiety and anxious symptoms. So, being in the present moment generally just increases overall happiness and well-being. So what about intimacy? Oh, before I go there, what is intimacy? What comes up for you with intimacy and what that might mean? Because I created an amalgam definition from, from just what I know in different definitions. Did you have a... I just think about that connection with another person that's centered in so many different aspects of intimacy. Yes, yes. Connection with another person, yes. Close connection. Anything else come up around intimacy, the word intimacy? Yes. Sharing and exposing your most vulnerable self. Yes. Sharing and exposing your most vulnerable self. And Monica? At SRI, we used to define it as in to me, you see. Oh, I love that. Intimacy, into me, you see. So that's, there are two components to that, right? One person looking and seeing, the ability and the willingness to see another person, the ability and willingness to be seen and to be vulnerable and expose parts of yourself to a trusted person. So that basically covers everything that I think. It's a relational dynamic where emotional and physical, which is an emotional and physical experience of deep presence and closeness, a willingness to see and accept the other, and a willingness and ability to be vulnerable and to be seen. And I say ability as well, because someone may have the willingness, and I have clients sometimes, and they're like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hold on to like that until I meet the right person, and then I will make myself vulnerable. Well, like anything else, we need to practice it, because then that comes, and all the anxiety of that perfect present, mo or that perfect moment, and that perfect person, you know, increases the anxiety and is the enemy of intimacy. So, the willingness and the ability. So one of the things before I move on I wanted to say really quickly, because presence and vulnerability are, can be very scary and very intense sometimes, depending on what's going on in your life. But even when life is good, life is intense. Life is an intense, intense thing. Being human 
is intense. Even joy is intense. Sometimes I think people drink or, or do things at celebrations just to kind of open themselves to that kind of intensity as well. Much less the intensity of something scary happening, especially if we've been exposed to, to very traumatic events or even moderately traumatic events. So one of the things that we need is self-regulation and mindfulness uh, uh, lends itself to that. So one of the things I wanted to say, and nobody said sex as intimacy, but sex and intimacy are kind of interchangeably used sometimes in the media or just in, in our society in general. So what is, th what is the difference is that they, sex and intimacy can occur together, and ideally will, but sex, can, sex without intimacy exists, right? Mm -hmm. So that, what does that look like? It's like two, two separate people having their bodies come together or touch, and, and even if both people are willing participants, there can be absolutely no connection or very little connection. And then, in, then there's, can there be intimacy without sex? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it can be with a loved one, it can be with a friend, it can be with a parent, it can be with a child. Intimacy is all those things that we talked about here. But people tend to use it interact, interact um, or interchangeably. So sometimes when I ask a couple, you know, have you been, um, have you been intimate this week? And what has it looked like? They're like, oh yes, Thursday night from this to this. And, and I said, no, well, well, what else? What about just the way you've been talking or touching or, you know, sharing? And they're like, oh, okay. But, <laughs> but it, it does behoove us to sometimes correct that or be explicit about what we mean. So... This is just um, a slide that really appealed to me because as, as infants and children, we know that for physiological development, for proper physiological development, we need emotional and physical intimacy. But we often forget about that as we get, grow older, and it still is a biological need. Even though we may be grown, we may be developed, we still have a biological need for skin-to-skin -skin contact. We still have a biological need for, for nurturance and to share and to ha have shared experiences and, and to feel loved. And we often forget that. And sometimes, I, I think that, you know, generally, women live longer than men. That may be shifting as, as our lifestyles kind of become uh, very similar. But one of the aspects, and they do studies on this as well, is that women are just, uh, in our culture at least, it's, it's culturally normative for ha us to maintain a lot of very close friendships, even when we're in partnership. So even in partnership or even in marriage, um, women tend to reach out and have more close relationships. And also, it's more culturally normative, unfortunately, for women to, to hug and kiss their friends and, and things like that. So again, as we shift as a culture, that may change as well. But that is one of the components. And this is just the, uh, one of the Chinese calligraphy symbols for mindfulness. And has anyone seen this before? Mm -hmm. OK, so there's a. There's a top of the character which is actually called the shelter, and this means now, and this means heart on the bottom. So it basically means mindfulness means presence of heart, which I think is also a very close uh, definition for intimacy. So I thought that was very interesting. So one of the things I keep saying is that the experiential is the most important because Mindfulness is not a study. It's become a study, and it's become popular, and it can fall out of popularity. We'll see. Yoga became this huge popularity, and it's still here. Um, but the practice is, of course, eons old. It's, it's uh, thousands of years old. And the pr mindfulness is a practice. It's not a study. The benefit is not in the study. And they actually have done studies on that. People who study mindfulness and then done the brain scans and people who practice. And, it, and the study really doesn't have a significant difference. It is the practice. So I'd love to lead, lead us right now in a practice. It may not be a strictly traditional mindfulness meditation practice, but it is a variation of it. So yeah, everything I want to just let you know, because everyone in this room has different experiences. And this is how I approach with clients as well. Everything is an invitation. If anything feels uncomfortable or you know just not right, you can, you can shift the practice to whatever you would like to do. You can open your eyes. You can stand if you like. Um, everything I'm going to do today is an invitation. So I just want to let you know that. And I'll invite you uh, to close your eyes if you'd like. And if you don't feel comfortable or somehow uh, triggered or have distress around closing your eyes at any point, 
You can always open them, and then I invite you just to maintain a gaze down the ground in front of you or the person's back in front of you. It's okay. <laughs> And um, I also uh, find it helpful for me to have both feet on the ground. So, as opposed to crossing or closing off any part of the body. And I put my hands however I'd like. You can have them palms up, palms down, clasped, just comfortable. So if you'd like to, you can close your eyes. If not, just lower your gaze. And just for a moment, I'd like you to just notice you're being held right now in space. You're being supported. And just notice, just silently to yourself, how that might be. The floor under your feet. The chair underneath your body. And perhaps at your back. even your own body supporting itself. Your hands may be resting on your body, on your lap. Each vertebra supporting the next. Even the gentle meeting of the eyelids or your lips may be a form of support. A communion. And right now, just noticing your, your natural breath, I'm going to invite you to find a place in your body that feels tight or tense or dense. Yeah, just notice. And what is that sensation like? How much space does it actually take up in your body? And if you'd like, you can even give it a color. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite us all as a group to take a deep breath in as if we could send the breath to that area of the body and circle it. And on an exhale, Maybe take a little bit out with us, and, and that's how the color can come in helpful. And you maybe just see a bit of that color coming out through your nostrils as you exhale. <clears throat> or maybe as if someone were pulling a little string or a thread unraveling that tight or dense or tense or painful ball. So if you'd like to join me all together, taking a deep breath in, intentional, and exhale, let go of a little something you don't need. Again, inhale deeply and exhale, soften, unravel. One more time to that area, inhale and exhale, just letting go a little bit and allowing your breath to return to its normal state. I'm going to invite you to, to observe the breath. And normally I'll give you one space to observe it, but I want to try something a little different today. And I also want you to observe any response in your body, heat, resistance, tightening of breath, loosening of breath. And just follow that in through your nose, down your throat, maybe expanding your lungs, diaphragm out contracting all the way back up again gently. So I'd like to give you an option if anything becomes distressing at any point or it's not something you want to do. You can just um, watch the breath and observe the breath just where it is or turn your attention to the sounds in the room, including the sounds in the room, inside your body or outside your body. But if you'd care to follow me, I want you to deepen your breath, again, becoming more intentional. And every inhale, maybe drop that awareness a little more deeper into your torso, lower into your torso, into your belly, and then back out again on an exhale. Maybe behind your diaphragm, expand, lifting it.
and out. And deeper into your abdomen and out. Just enough to really activate that part of your body and maybe even lower into your pelvis. Again, this is your choice. What does it feel like to breathe as if you could breathe all the way to the bottom of your pelvis on an inhale? Exhale, releasing it back up and out of your body. All the way down. As if you could expand or fill the bowl of your pelvis with the beautiful water of air, of oxygen. It's like filling a bowl, filling a bowl, and watching it empty. If there's any part of your body you still feel like you're holding more than you need to to maintain this position, I invite you to let go of it. Maybe it's even your face or your jaw, shoulders, hands. And releasing into just a regular breath again, just observing. Less intentional. Just observing your breath. Perhaps you can observe it at the belly or at your chest or just in your nostrils, the sensations going in and out of your nostrils. Just choose one space now. Any different sensations in your body now that you localize the breath a little more? And in a moment, I'm going to play the sound of a bell. And instead of leaping out of this, I invite you to listen to the entire resonance of the bell as long as you can hear it. And then take a deep breath in and out, and then raise your gaze again to join me in the room. Thank you. Thank you for practicing with me, you guys. So anything you notice, I, I'll take any, any comments, questions, concerns. Anything you noticed about any shift in your body or in your mind during that exercise? Body temperature? Thoughts about expanding into your pelvis? Anyone? I see you. Mm -hmm. When you brought your attention there, what happened? Because sometimes we realize how much we're, we're in pain or how much something is, is tight or tense, and then yeah, it can shift. Like breathing in, it, it, I mean, it definitely kind of helped. It, it made me aware of that area and just kind of like the thought of pushing it out kind of released a little bit of that stress. But um, mm -hmm. it's definitely interesting to, to find yourself aware of like yourself and your body for a minute. Yeah, yeah. We are rushing around, and we're rushing around like heads on wheels. We're very rarely, you know, inhabiting our full bodies, you know, myself included. And it's like, here, here, here. And that's why I build in pauses throughout the day, so I can, that stress level or that anxiety that's a 10, okay, maybe bring it down to a 4. Then it builds up again, and then you bring it down again. And then, you know, by taking these small breaks, even pausing, even pausing before you open the door for a client, instead of just like, okay, the note, and up, and... Pausing, pausing before we open a computer or turn on a car or exit a car. These things can really help. These are all acts of mindfulness, which I'll talk about at the end. I'm sure I'll have a little bit of time. So any adverse reactions anyone had? Anything that anyone have a negative response or it bring up a lot of resistance or anxiety at all? Yeah? Yes, I please. Think for me, I tried to do similar to what you did, April. I tried to breathe into the areas. And it's funny, I could only go so far. Mm-hmm. Yes. This far, this far, and that's it. Yeah. That's for today, and it's like, and that's okay. 
That's okay, yeah. And how do you tend to it normally? Yeah, I'm working on that. I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> because sometimes we need like to be more intentional. Yeah, like all of us. <laughs> yeah, like all of us. I, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So yes, sometimes there is a resistance, and I was also checking to see if there was any, a resistance going anywhere in the body. Um, sometimes I'll have a client who will just leap out of it and just start talking, because it's just so they're so un, not used to it, and it's it's it can be scary to become intimate with ourselves. So um, one of the things I that was us. Um, one of the things that I. Uh, Enjoy about mindfulness is also the sense of connectivity. It can increase a global sense of connectivity, which is also intimacy. You know, an intimacy with a sense of, of belonging in the world, as well as with each other's individuals. And one of the things that it really um, helps us increase is a sense of compassion. We can have compassion for ourselves, we can have compassion for others. And I'm going to talk about this study really quickly that. Um, was done in 2013, or at least published in 2013, where I think about 30 participants took place in this study. And so there were two control groups. The, the experimental group was a group that w got a course in mindfulness, a somatic, or sorry, a, a secular mindfulness, which is what I'm trained in. And so secular mindfulness course, again, eight weeks, not that long, once a week, I believe. The other groups, one got a group in actually compassion training without the mindfulness component of going home and meditating every night. And then the third group was on a wait list as far as they knew. They were just waiting to get into a class and they had no treatment at all. And so basically what the experiment was were these people were asked to come in and fill out some papers and, in an office space or a waiting room and that was the experiment. That was the lab. And they had confederates, actors, that came in um, that were sitting there in the room, so there would be two sitting and one available chair. And so the, usually the, the person would come in, the subject would come in and sit in the chair. A confederate would come into the room on crutches, and the person would, they would get, have one minute only to have a response. The person would come in on crutches and maybe have a bit of a sigh and, and lean against the wall and just be texting against the wall. And they found that the people who were in the meditation group were more than five times, even more than the compassion group, uh, likely to get up and give them the seat or to offer the seat. And, and they only had one minute. So that, I thought, was pretty profound as well and, and a really interesting study. So they call it a, we, we talk a lot about antisocial behavior, right? We rarely talk about pro-social behavior. But this was a measurement of pro-social pro behavior and impulses and following through on them because sometimes, the, the other confederates, the two other people in the chairs, they were told not to offer their seat. So sometimes if someone else doesn't do it, someone else doesn't give the dollar, or whatever it is, you're less inclined to. If, if you see someone else doing it, you're like, oh, or mine, you know? <laughs> but no one else is doing it. Okay, well, maybe the person's only going to be there for two minutes. You're less inclined. So it, it takes a little extra effort to have that pro-social activity in that, in that situation. Yes, please. No, it was it was a, a random assignment. Okay. Yes. So it, it had, didn't have anything to do with the type of person that would seek out a compassion group. Mm -hmm. There may be someone overall, like I think they were given the same kind of uh, instruction or leaflet or whatever. So maybe all of these people, they were all non-meditators before, by the way. All of these people may have been seeking out some sort of a compassion group. Everyone. And then they were put into either the compassion group, the meditation group. They didn't know what was happening with the other groups. You could have been the second one to sign up but still put on the waiting list. So, yes, good question. Thank you. Yes. So that, I thought, was, was a beautiful thing as well. So in that regard, I would like to have another experiential <laughs> situation. And now, this may be a little difficult how we're sitting, um, but I would like us to kind of break into twos, even for, for a, a moment. You may have to turn your chair. Um, and if there's an odd number, I will, I will join up with you. <laughs> so maybe the two of you go here, and then Lisa, you two go here. Yeah. Just turn to the person. Is there anyone who does not have a partner? 
you two can go here, and you, Miss, and this gentleman in the corner, could you go together, or do you have something? Okay. Okay. And so I'm going to invite you. Does everyone have a partner? I think the two of you, could the two of you work together? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to make this fairly brief, and we're going to have to speak quite, quite quietly. We're going to have to be sotto voce on this so that we don't drown out each other. So you may have to get a little intimate. So, <laughs> um, but what I would like is one person, and we'll say the person who has the longer hair will be the person who will, who will start as the person asking questions and listening to the response. The one question I would like them to ask is, what brings you joy? The other person then says whatever comes to their mind, maybe just one word or one thing. That person who asked the question then says, thank you. What brings you joy? And so the same person will be asking the question over and over. Do you want to do, to do it with me for one moment? Sure. I'll ask the questions. You can say whatever you like. And you don't have to say anything else, like, so Monica, just what brings you joy? Dancing. Thank you. What brings you joy? Ice cream. Thank you. <laughs> and just so on until I hit the bell and then we'll switch. When I hit the bell, I'll actually invite you to close your eyes for a moment and just kind of check on what's going on with your body. So for the listeners, the people who are asking the question, I'm going to ask if you ever tune out or you start thinking about what you want to say or thinking more about the story around that person, they've moved on, ground yourself in your body. Feel your feet, maybe feel your breath in your belly. Because when we ground ourselves in our bodies, we ground ourselves in the present moment and whoever is with us. It sounds counterintuitive to go internally to, to ground yourself with the other person. But if you just feel yourself drifting, go back into your body and somatically ground and then re and keep, re keep engaging. Okay? It's going to be very brief. And just, again, try to keep, keep your voices down. It's going to be difficult. Okay. <laughs> Begin. <laughs> What brings you joy? What brings you joy? Specifically, Thank you. What brings you joy? Yoga and and remember to thank the person for their response. Your only response is thank you. Nope, just one person, one way. Mm -hmm. Finish your last response. Thank the person. And close your eyes, everyone. Finish your last response and close your eyes, please. Just close your eyes and then just check in. What are the sensations going on in your body? As the listener, as the speaker, and yes, just close your eyes and check in with your bodies. When I hit the bell again, you're going to open your eyes and the other person will be the one to ask what brings you joy. Thank you for your response and to continue asking what brings you joy. My dog did.
<laughs> okay? Nope, just closing your eyes. No, no, no discussion, just closing your eyes. Closing your eyes, taking in the sensations. Taking in the sensations in your body. Just closing your eyes for a moment. What do you notice? Your skin, your belly, your face. temperature. And you can open your eyes and just thank your partner and, and turn your seats back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. So, I love the bell. It's <laughs> very handy. <laughs> So what did you notice? What did you notice as a listener? And what did you notice as a speaker? What did you notice? Yes. I was nervous in like both roles. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why, but I was. Okay, so how did you know you were nervous? How did you know in your body? I felt warmer. Okay, yes. Engaging with someone, especially someone you don't know, if you don't know each other, can be, okay, there's anticipation, there's performance anxiety maybe. We can get warmer. Maybe a little shaky. Okay, so you felt in, in both ways? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that vulnerability. Yeah. Even in just sharing, you know, something like this. So imagine sharing even something uh, deeper with your partner, like what scares you about sex? Mm -hmm. Listening to the answer. Thank you. What scares you about sex? And you can do the same thing. What do you love about sex? That can be something as well that can be a very intimate conversation. That's where sex and intimacy can collide, you know? Um, so any, anyone else have any observation? Yes. How does it make you feel so good to think about and say the things that make you think of you joy? Mm -hmm. And then when you're asking somebody else, it's wonderful to be able to give them the opportunity, which also makes you feel good. So both of it's like a win-win for both. Yeah, great. So sharing what you feel like, bringing to mind we don't often sit there during the day and be like, what brings me joy? <laughs> no, it's like, what do I have to do in the next five minutes? What brings you joy? It's a, re it's, it's, it's a really relieving thing to do. Thank you for sharing that. Yes? Well, I noticed you had asked us to try to resist thinking in advance. Yes. And, and to really just be in the moment. So what I noticed was in the moment of that moment, the things that, brought me, the things that I felt that brought me joy might actually a little bit different than the things that might bring me joy if you were to ask me at a time when I wasn't in that state. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Curious, yeah. So it's it's yeah. it's a living it's a living um, conversation can, that can shift. But was it was it was it accessible for you oh, right yeah. now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a wonderful space. It felt very nice in the space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. What do you think would have been different if you sat down and you were thinking or writing an essay about what brings you joy? Well, the one thing that I noticed that struck me since you asked was mm -hmm. that I didn't say my words. Oh. <laughs> 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 and I was a little bit saying that because I do get a lot of joy in my yeah. work and a lot of pleasure and fulfillment. Yes. Yeah, and it can, that's, it can change every time, and sometimes it's about, yeah, just, just saying, oh, wait, I didn't say everything I wanted to say, but you said what came to you then, and that was, yeah. that's fine. It's infinite, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Just piggyback off that, I feel like it's kind of like, uh, with like technology and things of that sort, like it's, with text messaging, you like have time to think about it. Yes. So your answer is completely different than if somebody were to ask you on the spot. Yes. So I, I noticed that the things that I was saying also Yes. Have the exact answer that I want versus when you're sitting there and you're trying not to think about it, and it's just what comes out. Yeah. So. Present moment, which is also why it feels more vulnerable. You haven't had the time to cultivate, to curate a response. We are a culture now of curated responses. 
I mean, there's almost nothing that's spontaneous except when you're speaking live. Um, and even then, you know, you have to put some preparation to something like this. But speaking live with someone, and in, we are decreasing our face-to-face -face time. And I'm wondering what that's going to be doing. I have theories of what that's going to be doing, having worked with uh, adolescents and young people a lot who can't let go of it or can't make eye contact or can't say I love the text I love you to someone sitting next to them you know it's they have amazing skills that we didn't have in certain ways but there is going to be such a limited sense of intimacy and a lot of pathology around that I fear and I have seen already and and, and that scares me I don't want to be a technophobe but I do want to say you know we're not taking care of what we need to take care of as far as being a, a, a human connection as far as uh, tolerating the intensity of being human um, yeah, there's, there's that, but it's convenient. Yeah. That's interesting. So being 30, like I, I went to high school without technology. It was so much. So like when you dated, you talked on the phone for four hours. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's all through text messaging. So it's, it's really interesting to, to see how that plays out like with dating. And if someone, if some man or woman were supposed to be calling you up and asking you out, um, and they were talking to you on the phone, what, what, what would you... It makes me incredibly nervous. So mm -hmm. when I see that somebody's actually calling me, I'm like, <coughs> and there have definitely been times that I like won't pick up. I'm like, uh, I think about this. Go to voicemail, let <laughs> Go to you voicemail know. And, like, no. I'll text you back, or like, let me let me get it together and I'll call them back. But it's it's harder definitely to talk on the phone. Yeah, Are yeah. <laughs> Other nods here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just really quick. Uh, generationally, I would have a fit if somebody text me to ask you out for the first out. time. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the technology thing, I have uh, young daughters, I have a 15 year old, mm. and she had a lot of early trauma, and I've learned that I do better when I actually text her in advance what we need to talk about. Oh, okay. It gives her a chance to process it, yeah. and then, because if I just bring it up, it's all attitude, and then we're fighting because she needs me with this, but if I text... She's more available. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing yes that. No. So that's yes and no. Well, yes and no, because I fear, like, to the, the human connectionness to just be able to have a conversation. What happens is when you can't text her, and it is an immediate confrontation, and she's like, oh, my God, it's just what I do now because I found that it works. But I do mm -hmm. worry about what happens when she gets a job. Nobody's going to text her, well, if you didn't do good, or here's your evaluation, we're going to talk about it. Yeah. So it's a good and bad thing. Yes, yeah. yes but you're meeting her where she is. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes? Well, that makes me wonder about how you, after this exercise, transitioned to what scares you about sex, for example. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. doing that with a client, so you're already, you kind of created this very comfortable, vulnerable space. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Do you then? I would more invite to couples to do that with each other, mm -hmm. but I could do it with a client. That's what I, ooh, and that's to be trans. Yes, right, yes. On the couch. Yes. Yeah. So that then they can have that conversation with an open heart at that point. An open heart in a, in a safe container, yeah. And I have done that exercise in, to be transparent at a, at a tantric uh, teaching, and it was really profound because it's like the, re the repetition, the layers come down. And, you, and not being afraid of, of, of repeating the answer as well and having the same answer. And it's like, okay, inadequacy, inadequacy. All of a sudden ball of inadequacy comes up and out of you and and this huge emotion was there and so that was a really profound thing for me so it's something that I like to bring in but again you have to have that trust and and rapport and understand what you're working with it's not something you want to throw someone in who's who's had sexual trauma you know session one um, but it is it is a beautiful way to open someone to some of their most vulnerable parts because I believe and that's why I work here that our sexuality is, is just this blaring magnif magnification of everything that is good and everything that is difficult and challenging with, with what we experience. And it can come out in that a, a, a lot. And that's why I was saying if anyone you know, had an opposition to breathing into their pelvis or anything like that, because there is a lot of, we protect ourselves, we harm ourselves, we reward ourselves through this really profound, you know, system in our body and our minds, and very few people talk about it. We don't talk about it in, 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 in our everyday culture. And when it is, 
it's completely wrong. It's not, it's not accurate. And it's this weird distortion, uh, the most intense being pornography. But even in you know, regular media, it's, it's talked about in ways that are fantastical and, and shown in ways that are fantastical. And when people want to have a real conversation, people are like aver adverse to it. And so I think it's, it's important to have safe spaces for that. And, and yeah, I invite you to go there. Let them know what you're doing and see if they'll, they'll be open to it. But yeah, I think it's a powerful thing to do. Um, so one of the things, yikes, um, I wanted to touch on really briefly, and you may have heard of, is sensate focus therapy um, coined by Masters and Johnson. And when people, when couples are having trouble kind of marrying the intimacy and the sex, maybe there's erectile dysfunction or any kind of other, uh, you know, arousal or anxiety issues around sex, sometimes I say, why don't, for, for two days this week, one with you receiving, one with you receiving, orgasm and sex as you know at intercourse is off the table. And I just want one person to receive, just as you did in, in, in that dyad, one person to receive and one person just to explore the other person's body. It can be just starting with um, touching their hair, their forehead, pressing your cheek against theirs. And again, this is, this is for lovers. <laughs> um, and, or, or smelling someone behind their ears placing a hand on someone's chest, almost like you're an alien and you drop down here with this beautiful creature you feel this love for, but you just don't, you, it's just wonder, just going in with wonder, curiosity. And, you know, and, and even if someone becomes aroused, avoiding pushing that to some sort of agenda or end. And so it could be almost like, and, and I'm like, it's not necessarily a massage because then that becomes with an agenda as well. And if it, if it falls into tickling, because things will maybe tickle, you can, the person can say that tickles, but don't keep going there because a tickle fight can then be something that's avoidant <laughs> of the intimacy. So the person who's touching may just touch. And the person who is uh, receiving may give verbal and nonverbal responses. And they can say, I don't like that. You know, I know a lot of people who don't like to be touched on certain parts of their body that their partner thinks are their main erogenous zones, and it's, and it's not. And just to say, I, I don't like that, and then of course you don't, keep going there, but the person who's touching doesn't need to talk at all, and the person who's receiving can just, are we at five? Wah! Okay. Uh -huh. So I want to do, so without, yes? With, you said without intercourse, yes. you mean without orgasm as well? Yeah. 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 Okay. And just, I mean, it could get there, but I like to really slow it down, and one day, even that entire, that entire day, orgasm or intercourse is off the table, and that's all you're doing. And then another day, it will be the other person's turn to receive and the other person's turn to explore. Do they talk so, about it afterwards? Yes, they talk about it throughout. Well, they, will talk, they can talk about it afterwards, but throughout, the person receiving will be giving verbal and nonverbal feedback, even if it's like, mm, or like a, a giggle, or, or, yeah, that feels kind of strange. Uh, whatever it is that they want to share. And then they can certainly talk about it afterwards and, and what maybe, uh, and new things that happened for both of them. So I'm standing off camera, I believe, right now. But I wanted to pass these out. If you don't mind, these have been washed. Um, these are grapes. If you might, don't mind just pouring one into your hand. I didn't have enough cups for everyone, so I put two, two in each cup. I was going to trick you, and I was going to say, who's a brave soul that will do a sensate exercise with me? <laughs> um, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, who will be brave enough to gently disrobe right now? No, but instead, <laughs> it's, 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 you never know. It's a me, yes. It's, it, that would be a mean trick. But instead, I'd like you to each hold the grape. Don't eat the grape. Just hold it in your hand. Yes, just take one grape. Oh, okay. So take one grape. And because of, in, in the interest of time, as you're passing these grapes back, Who's missing a grape? One each. Who's missing grapes? Two. You have two? So just take one and pass behind. There you go. Grape. One more grape back here. There you go. You're welcome. Oh, I'm so sorry. So it's like you two. Oopsie. There you go. So in the interest of time, in the interest of time, I'd just like to, to have you take the one grape in your hand. And before you eat it, if you want to eat it, just kind of like look at it. How is it feeling in your hand? Because normally we take a grape, we're like, right? So mindful eating is one of the ways we can daily 
practice mindful intimacy. So how does it feel? How do you feel about to eat this grape? Maybe you're a little hungry or thirsty and you, and you want it. Maybe you're anticipating it being sour or sweet. And now I'm going to invite you just to kind of place it in your mouth without chewing it. Notice the sensation. Oh, you had a mint. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then gently take that first bite. What's it like to break through that skin? And then slowly, slowly complete. So you felt the tart here, I see. Yeah. And just notice. Sometimes mindful eating, what we do is we have nothing else going on, perhaps sharing it with a person um, that, that we're with, but just no TV, nothing else, which is hard for me because I like watching my programs while I eat. But <laughs> placing the fork down in between bites while you're eating or placing the sandwich down instead of holding it, anticipating that next bite, what's it like to just really be in that bite and place the fork down, pick up the fork again for the next bite? I go on retreats sometimes and we have these really long meals. Everyone's silent, no one's making eye contact for five days, however long it is. And yeah, the meals can be just really like the highlight of the day because you are super, super present and everything is really fresh and nice. So yeah, that's something I, I invite you to do. And I'm gonna skip. So some of the daily acts, mindful eating, uh, making eye contact. Sometimes we come in, if we live with people, we come in or we have partners, we come in and it's just like jump, dumping into the day or we don't stop and m meaningful greetings. Saying, hey, and I have, I, have this, I have a partner that's like, hi. Because I'll walk in and be like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it's like, hi. And just really take the person in. If you hug, you hug, or you kiss, you kiss. And that's what's happening right then for that moment. It takes 10 seconds. That can make all the difference in a relationship, having that twice a day. Mindful meal times, I talked about that. Risking rupture and having time for repair. So we all know about rupture and repair, but having someone be courageous enough to talk about what's not working for them in a relationship. Sometimes people hold their voice, especially if they think it's inconvenient or nagging or, or too small. If the thought comes up two or three times, maybe it's time to share that with your partner. And risking the fact that the, partner, the, the, the possibility of the partner not getting what you, what you mean. Mindful listening, we did with that exercise. And one other thing, I like to track the somatic yes and the somatic know in your body. What are you attracted to? What are you adverse to? When it's meal time, what's going on in your body? Is you're like, oh, okay. When it's something, someone's coming towards you, they know it's gonna ask you a favor you don't, don't want, or somebody's talking too much, or there's a client that's not your favorite. <laughs> what does that feel like in your body? That no, and sometimes just acknowledging it can quiet that aversion. Just being like, okay. Okay, my stomach's tightening up. Um, I just took my first breath in about 20 seconds. Uh, I'm leaning back. Just naming it can, can release it a little bit more, bringing you back into the prefrontal cortex. So these are just some things that you can bring into daily acts of mindful intimacy and bringing with each other. I do have to stop. Um, this is a little uh, ahead of time, but if there's any pressing questions, I did have a little discussion before, so I'm, I'm glad for that. Any questions that anyone has? Any comments, concerns? Yes, I did skip back. So, um, love languages. Speaking to your partner in their love language. Thank you. Gary Chapman wrote the book called The Five Love Languages. And I often work with my clients to say, you know, are you speaking in your partner's love language? Because they may be like, I'm giving him all the compliments in the world and he's not. I'm like, well, what do you think he responds to? Have you tried placing your hand, you know, on his shoulder or on the back of his neck or something when you're about to say something difficult? Are you have, uh, maybe somebody's, so the five love languages, and I'll just list them, are acts of service, words of affirmation, loving touch, gift giving, and quality time. Thank you, yes. And we tend to have one or two that we prefer to receive, and that tends to be what we give more readily as well. So if I'm a words of affirmation person, I will tend to give words of affirmation more. And your partner may like that. Um, but maybe they are a quality time person and you're, you're texting them words of affirmation or giving them words of affirmation and you don't really have time to just sit down and be with them without some sort of agenda and maybe that makes them feel loved. Gifts yeah. of what again? Of just gift just giving, gifts. yeah, okay. thoughtful gifts. Thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we, we do have to end, but I really thank you so much for your participation, being outside the box, eating grapes, talking to strangers, and um, getting in your bodies. And I invite you all the way to your cars to feel your feet, every step, just feel your feet. Thank you. Thank you guys.